really drive change. And today what I want to do is to take maybe about 45 minutes or so and give you a, a synopsis of this three box solution book. And one way I can start this is by pointing out that strategy is not about celebrating the past. It's not about celebrating the present. It's only about leadership in the future. Because an organization is a leader today, it cannot assume it will be a leader tomorrow. And I say earning the leadership is what strategy is all about. And if strategy is about leadership in the future, one thing we know, every industry changes in the future. Therefore, if you want to be a leader in the future, you have to adapt to change. Another word for adapting to change is innovation. Therefore, I say strategy is innovation. If your organization is not doing innovation, it's not doing strategy, it's doing something else. Strategy equals leadership in the future. Leadership in the future equals adapting to change. Adapting to change equals innovation. Therefore, I assert strategy equals innovation. When we make a statement like this, typically what executives ask me is, is innovation needed in every industry? Can't we think of one industry which rarely changes? Therefore, adapting to change is not important. Therefore, innovation is not important. Typically, executives point to one industry where they think innovation is not needed. This is the industry I am part of. Academics. People always say, come on, universities, they don't innovate. They don't have to innovate. Let me ask you a question. Suppose we were preparing the list of the top 10 universities in the world 100 years ago. Out of that list, how many of them would be American universities? Just shout out an answer for me. If you're preparing the list of the top 10 universities in the world 100 years ago, out of that top 10, how many would be American universities? I think that one who said none, that is the right answer. In fact, not even the mighty Harvard was in the top ten. Do you know which country had the most number of universities in the top ten? UK. UK is a very good guess, Oxford came in for sure, but it turned out to be Germany. Germany had six of the top ten universities in the world. If the university industry was a static industry and there was absolutely no breakthrough innovation in the university industry for the last 100 years, and if you are preparing the list of the top 10 today, the list has got to be identical. And one thing we know, the list is completely turned upside down. In fact, there is not a single German university on that list today. And it is populated with American universities, the Harvard and the MIT and the Stanford's of the world. Now, if we have time, we can do an analysis. What kinds of breakthrough innovations did American universities pull off in the last 100 years to become the leaders in higher education today? Certainly, the American universities did breakthrough innovation in their product. Product for a university would be the curriculum. They certainly made some major changes in the curriculum. But breakthrough innovation, for any organization is possible in non-product areas, in what I call the entire business model. As an example of a non-product area where American universities pulled off a, a breakthrough innovation would be control over alumni. Cultivating alumni relations is an American game changer. Today, Harvard, MIT, Stanford are clearly leaders in higher education. That does not mean they can assume they will be a leader tomorrow. Just like the way the German universities were a leader 100 years ago in higher education, simply could assume they will remain a leader in the future. You have to earn that leadership. And that's what strategy is all about. If strategy is about leadership in the future, whenever I work with Indian companies, I typically ask them a very simple question. I know you're doing a lot of projects inside your company today. Out of all those projects, can you name three projects you're doing today 
which will make you a leader in the future. If that's what strategy is all about. Another way I can ask the same question is to ask executives to think about all the projects they're executing today inside their organization and put those projects into three boxes. How many of the projects you're doing today will be in box one? And to me, box one is about manage the present. It's about improve the performance of your current business models the way they are constructed today. How many of the projects you're executing today will be in box two? And box two is about selectively forget the past. And how many of the projects you're executing today will be in box three? And box three is about create the future. Manage the present, box one. Selectively abandon the past, box two. And create the future, box three. And what I find working with organizations is organizations way more focus on box one. And then they think they're doing strategy. As I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, strategy has nothing to do with the past. It's got nothing to do with the present. It's got nothing to do with box work. Strategy has nothing to do with competing for the present. Another word for box two, box three is competition for the future. I say strategy has a lot to do with competing for the future. And one thing we know, competition for the present is extremely important. It is just as important as competition for the future. Therefore, strategy is about how do you create your future while managing the present? How do you shape the evolution of year 2025 when you're squarely executing projects in the year 2016? And the reason why this is a challenge is the thinking process and the execution methodologies you need in box one are fundamentally different than the thinking process and the execution methodology you need in box two, box three. Yet in the year 2016, you better have box one projects. But in the year 2016, you better have box two, box three, breakthrough, innovation experiments. Yet they require different people, they require different capabilities, they require different processes, different metrics. This is the central strategic challenge. Going back to the example of American universities, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, they are clearly leaders in higher education today. That doesn't mean they can assume they'll be a leader tomorrow. And I say learning the leadership, competing for the future is what strategy is all about. A box two, box three, breakthrough innovation experiment. And that innovation experiment is if you are willing to take the MIT online courses and if you are willing to subject yourself to the same rigorous tests that are given to the MIT engineering schools who come on campus, you will get an MIT degree. Don't tell me this experiment doesn't have the potential to fundamentally change MIT going forward, fundamentally change higher education going forward. By the way, the message I give to companies is a very, very simple message. Because it is simple to say does not mean it is easy to do. In fact, the message I'm going to deliver to you in these 30 minutes is nothing but common sense. But common sense is never common practice. And my common sense message is future is now. Future is never about what you have to do in the future. And the reason why this is so hard, you have two jobs to do. One job is in box one. Another job is in box two, box three, inventing that future. <laughs> Yet there are inherent conflicts, inherent paradoxes, inherent tensions between the two. I say this is the central strategic challenge. This is the central leadership challenge. Let me take a minute and highlight for you what the fundamental difference is between box one projects, which are all about efficiency on the one hand, and box two, box three projects, which are all about innovation on the other. Box one projects, competition for the present projects, 
are always in response to what I call clear signals and linear changes in the industry. Because you are responding to clear signals and linear changes in the industry, the organizational response would be incremental improvements in your current business model. Call it Six Sigma quality. Call it continuous process improvement. Call it operational excellence. These are all powerful ideas, but they are box one ideas. Competition for the future projects, box two, box three projects, are always in response to what I call weak signals and non-linear changes in the industry. Because you are responding to non-linear changes in the industry, the organizational response would be breakthrough innovation, leapfrog innovation, non-linear innovation, box three innovation. Now, what is an example of a non-linear change in the industry which gave rise to non-linear innovation? If you want to take a look at the last two decades, I would say the internet itself was a non-linear change. Why? Because non-linear changes in the industry will give rise to breakthrough innovation, non-linear innovation. Concepts like eBay, Amazon.com, Google, Flipkart, these kinds of non-linear business models would not be possible without a discontinuous shift called the internet. Now, for Indian companies, say in the next two decades, what would be the non-linear changes in the industry which can open up all kinds of opportunities? Certainly, technology will transform every industry, including all the industries in India. But technology is not the only source of non-linear changes. There would be huge customer discontinuities. Customers of the future could be fundamentally different than the customers of the present. If they are fundamentally different, they will also demand box three innovation. There could be non-traditional competitors who can come into your space and force you to remake yourself. Let me give you an example of a customer discontinuity, which is impacting just about every organization in the world. I am talking about emerging markets, like India and China. If you are an American company, you cannot take business models you created for Middle America in box one and simply send those business models to India and hope to capture Middle India. Why? Because emerging markets represents a huge customer discontinuity. Customers in emerging markets are fundamentally different than customers in developed markets. Because they are fundamentally different, they will also demand box three innovation. They will demand leapfrog innovation. They will demand non-linear innovation. Why might this be true? You see, take a look at a simple statistic like per capita income. Per capita income in the US is $50,000. Per capita income in India is $1,500. What that tells me is there is no business model you have created for middle America in box one in the US where the mass market per capita income is $50,000. You can simply send to India and hope to capture middle India, where the mass market per capita income is $1,500. You have to engage in box free innovation. Let me give you an example of a company which did box free innovation in India and thereby reap enormous benefits. The example I'm going to give you is General Electric. This is GE in their healthcare business. GE in their healthcare business, they make medical imaging equipment. This would be an ultrasound machine, an x-ray machine, a tax scanner, an MR machine. And what you're seeing here, which is an electrocardiogram or an ECG machine. As you know, ECG is the first point of diagnosis for heart attack. And GE innovated this machine for the American consumer. This is an extremely powerful machine. This has saved lives for hospital structure. If you walk into an American hospital, what you're likely to see is a sophisticated imaging center. And in that sophisticated imaging center, you will have appliance size equipment. That will be a $1 million x-ray machine, $2 million CAT scanner, $3 million MR machine, and this $20,000 ECG machine. 
And when the doctor asks the patient to go to the imaging center, the patient goes there. This is the way an American hospital is structured. I want you to shift the scene for a moment to India. Certainly, GE sells this $20,000 ECG machine in India, for sure, to the top 10% of the economic pyramid. After all, there are going to be rich folks in poor countries, just like the way you have poor folks in rich countries. It may be a thin slice, but it exists. Even in India, we have high-end hospitals like Apollo, Manipal, Forest, catering to the very rich folks. And those high-end hospitals can afford to buy this $20,000 ECG machine. The question is, what about the remaining 19% of Indians? For the remaining 19% of Indians, this $20,000 ECG machine is practically useless. Why? The first and the most obvious reason is affordability. You see, on this $20,000 ECG machine, a single ECG scan will cost $200. Well, 90% of Indians, most of them live in rural India. And in rural India, people are making $2 a day, sometimes even less. Now, you can do the mental math. If I'm making $2 a day, and somebody is selling me an ECG scan for $200, I have to work for 100 days just to pay for one scan. And that's only to determine whether I need further tests. I'm going to say, forget it. I can live with my chest pain. But affordability is not the only reason why 90% of Indians are non-consumers of this $20,000 ECG issue. Why? You see, in rural India, you don't have hospitals with sophisticated imaging centers. That means you can't ask the patient to go to the hospital. The hospital has to come to the patient. That means somebody has got to take this $20,000 ECG machine door to door. Unfortunately, this $20,000 ECG machine weighs 500 pounds. If something weighs 500 pounds, I can't put it in my backpack and take it door to door. Suppose you manage to take, put it in a bus and take it to rural India. And let's also assume 90% of Indians can actually are able and willing to pay the $200. And you manage to take this in a bus over there. Still, 90% of Indians will be non-consumers. Why? You see, in rural India, electricity is either unavailable or unreliable. Unfortunately, this $20,000 ECG machine works only on house current. So even if you manage to take this in a bus to rural India, and even if every rural person is willing and able to pay the $200, maybe there is no electricity to operate this piece of equipment. Suppose, let's assume, 90% of Indians are willing and able to pay for this $200 per stand. And we manage to take it efficiently in a bus over there. And let us also make a further assumption that 90% of India, we have 100% assured electricity. Still, 90% of Indians will be non-consumers of this $20,000 ECG machine. Why? You see, this $20,000 ECG machine is an extraordinarily powerful piece of equipment. This can be operated only by trained doctors. In fact, usually it comes with a 500-page user's manual. But in rural India, there are no trained doctors. That means 90% of India <coughs> cannot use this $20,000 ECG machine. That doesn't mean 90% of Indians don't suffer from heart attack. This is one of the main points that I want to leave with you. Non-consumers have exactly the same problem as consumers. Non-consumers have exactly the same needs as the consumers. The reason they are non-consumers is they cannot consume the business model you are giving to the consumers. If they could consume it, they would already become consumers. If you can do leapfrog innovation, if you can do fundamental innovation, you can do exponential innovation, you can do breakthrough innovation, you can do box innovation. There is tremendous value we can unlock. 
In fact, on planet Earth today, there are 7 billion people. Out of the 7 billion people, only 2 billion have the purchasing power to buy the goods and services corporations make today. There are 5 billion non-consumers. I say converting those 5 million non-consumers into consumers represents the single biggest growth opportunity. And out of the 5 billion non-consumers, 1 billion of them are in India. And I say this is perhaps the single biggest growth opportunity for Indian companies. How do we convert 1 billion non-consumers in India into consumers? And if you want to do that, you have to engage in Boston Innovation. In 2008, when I went to work for GE, one of the very first projects we did was to innovate this $100 ECG machine. On this $100 ECG machine, a single ECG scan will cost 10 cents. But single ECG scan costs 10 cents, even if I'm making only $2 a day, if I got a severe chest pain, I am willing to allocate 10 cents for a scan. In fact, my rule of thumb is, if you want to convert non-consumers into consumers in urban India, you better come up with a 10% solution. If you want to convert non-consumers into consumers in rural India, you better come up with a 1% solution. That means, if a product costed $100 in the US, it better cost $10 in urban India. It better cost a dollar in rural India. Besides being affordable, this $100 ECG machine is extremely lightweight. It weighs less than a can of Coca-Cola. If something weighs less than a can of Coca-Cola, I can put it in my backpack and take it to the road. Not only that, this $100 ECG machine works on battery. On a single battery charge, it can produce 750 ECG scans. Finally, this $100 ECG machine is extremely simple to use. It has got only two buttons. There is a green button, and then there is a red button. You push the green button, it works. You push the red button, it stops. As long as you know how to read traffic signs, you should be able to operate this machine. <coughs> GE has converted a whole lot of non-consumers into consumers using this $100 ECG machine. Box 3 is about creating the market. Box 1 is a market share game. Both are important, but I believe in India, the time has come for us to focus a lot more on creating the market. That's where the biggest opportunity for growth in India is. By the way, if you want to take a look at the last two decades, we have done leapfrog innovation in India. We have done breakthrough innovation in India. We have done box three innovation in India. We have done non-linear innovation in India. I would say the whole telecom revolution is a box three innovation. And it happened a fairly short period of time. If you go back 25 years ago, just to get a telephone connection was so difficult. You apply for a telephone connection, and before you die, maybe you'll get a telephone connected. But even if you are fortunate to get a telephone connected, 95% of the time it didn't work anyway. And even when it worked, the long distance calls were prohibitively expensive. This was the scenario in India 20, 25 years ago. Think about the telecom revolution, what Bharti Yatra has done. That's a box three innovation. Mahendra, Mahendra, Scorpio, SUV, it's a box three innovation. I mean, I care. It's a box three innovation. They are able to do cataract surgery for $200. Cataract surgery in the US costs $5,000. Narayana Vidalia Heart Hospital in Bangalore, that's a box three innovation. They are able to do open heart surgery for $3,000. <coughs> Open heart surgery in the US will cost well over $150,000. We have done box three innovation before. And all that I'm talking about seems so common sense. If it is such a common sense, why is this not common practice? One way I can explain why box two, box three is so difficult to do, even though it is so easy to say, is by taking a metaphor from sports. And what I have here is the gold medal winners in high jump in the Olympics. Olympics, I suppose, started in 1896, so we have got about 100 plus years of data here. When you plot the 100 years of data of gold medal winners in high jump in Olympics, 
what you immediately see is there have been four box two, box three business model transformations in the high jump industry. And only when the style in high jump went through a non-linear change could the high jumper go to the next level of performance. But the first slide in high jump was scissors. By the way, even today, if someone asks you to do high jump, I bet you you will use scissors. Think about it. Suppose you're walking on the road and you find a little rock, what do you do? You're going to jump over it just like the way a hurdle will jump. It's a hurtling motion. Inside Indian corporations, we have lots and lots of scissors. Then scissors is the style in the hygiene industry. And if you are a hygiene firm, you have a job to do. What is the job? Accept the rules of scissors and become the number one person in the scissors in the world. This is what I call box one challenge. This is about continuously improving the performance of scissors. By the way, is this important to do? Absolutely critical. Why? Because the scissors inside your organization still has many years of useful life left. For General Electric Healthcare, their scissors is the $20,000 easy machine. That's their box one business. But that scissors still has many years of useful life left. Because the $20,000 ECG machine, the high-end ECG machine, still has a market in the US, has a market in other rich countries, has even a market in India, in the high-end hospitals. Therefore, if you're general electric, you better put resources to make your current scissors become even more efficient. But what I'm saying is, 100% of the resources you allocate today cannot be about perfecting the scissors. You can do that only if you're absolutely confident there will be no more change. There will be no more non-linear changes in the world ever. Unfortunately, whether with you or without you, in the future, non-consumers will become consumers and demand Boston innovation. Disruptive technologies will open up all kinds of opportunities for Boston innovation. Non-traditional competitors will come into your space and force you to remake yourself. That is why I say, today, you must allocate resources to make your scissors become more efficient. But today, you must also allocate resources and do box two, box three, breakthrough innovation experiments, just like the way MIT is doing one, which will transform the scissors. By the way, if there was no non-linear innovation in the high jump industry in the last 100 years, if all that we have done in the high jump industry in the last 100 years is linear innovation and no non-linear innovation, we simply improved the performance of scissors. That's all we did. We never did a non-linear change. The business model of the high jump industry, high jumpers cannot achieve the performance they are achieving. In 1896, when scissors was invented, the first high jumper did four feet two inches. Suppose in the last 100 years, all that we have done is to simply improve the efficiency of scissors. That's all we did. We didn't do any non-linear change to scissors. High jumpers cannot achieve the performance they are achieving. Today, high jumpers go well over nine feet. That is impossible with scissors. However much you improve its efficiency. Why? Because scissors is a hurdling motion. If you use a hurdling motion, the center of gravity will define how, how you can lift your body. There is only so much Six Sigma you can do. <coughs> if you want to beat the center of gravity, you have to change the business model. And that's what somebody did and came up with the Western role. I got a picture of the Western role there. If you don't understand that picture, what happens in the Western role is you run up to the pole, you kick off of your right foot, you clear the bar, but unlike scissors, you still land on your right foot. So if you're going to kick off of your right foot and still land on your right foot, that means your back is to the pole when you clear the pole. Can you visualize that? I'm certainly not planning to demonstrate that. <laughs> Western wall was in work for about 25 years until someone invented the Eastern wall, which came to be called the straddle. And again, as the picture shows, what happens with the straddle is you run up to the pole, 
the kickoff builder of your right foot. You clear the bar, but unlike Western road, you land on your left foot. So you're going to kick off of your right foot, but land on your left foot. That means your belly is to the pole when you clear the pole. That doesn't work for about 25 years until someone invented the phosphory flop. To no one's surprise, it was invented by a phosphory. As the picture shows, what happens in the flop is you run up to the pole, then you launch yourself with two feet straight up in the air. And once you launch yourself like that, then you twist your body 180 degrees. Just like the way a gymnast might twist his body. In fact, the twisting motion was a box two, box three breakthrough idea. Because the twisting motion allowed Dick Fosbury to break out of the center of gravity and elevate quite a bit higher. Again, imagine what happens in the flop. You're running you're launching place. straight up, you're twisting your body. That means you are still straight up. Therefore, as the picture shows, the very first thing that crosses the bar is your head. In fact, if you stop to think about it, possibly flop is the most illogical way to do hydro. Why? Because, for one thing, you're not even looking at the bar. You're looking away from the bar. For another, head clears the bar first. For 100 years, we have been told in the high jump industry, leg must clear the bar first. Why? Because leg lands first. Whereas in the flop, actually head clears the bar first. Then it is your neck. Then it is your back. In fact, the leg clears the bar the last. You never only land on your head, so to speak. This is the central challenge for Indian companies today. Today, we must allocate resources to make our current scissors become even more efficient. But today, I must allocate resources to transform that scissors into a monster form. By the way, what Bharti Yatal did was to create a phosphory form. When the whole telecom sector was playing by scissors, they created a phosphory form. By the way, what IT services industry has done in this country? 20 years ago, the IT services industry, of which several of you are present here, they had a boss three idea. And that boss three idea was global service delivery model. That's a boss three breakthrough insight. It said, why don't we just do 10% of our work closer to the customer in the US, where the cost structure is very high. We will do the remaining 90% in India, where the cost structure is dramatically low, and the capabilities are dramatically high. Think about how much wealth we have created in this country with that box we use. How many jobs we have created, how much prosperity we have created. However, that box three inside, Global service delivery model has not become box one for IT services. Therefore, we need to do the next phosphory form. This is the challenge for companies. The box one, two, three is not a one-time activity. It's not an event. It's a continuous rhythmic process. So Bharti Yatra now has to think about what's my next box three. Narayana Vidal, a hot hospital, has to think about what's my next box three. What have I said? This is the way I want to wrap up and take your questions. This is what I'm saying. Whenever I visit Indian companies, I ask them, tell me how many projects you have which will be in box one. To me, box one is about closing performance gap. And you close performance gap by what I call linear innovation. Here is where you employ concepts like Six Sigma, lean, total quality management, operational excellence, enterprise resource planning, time-based competition. All are important ideas, but they are box one ideas. Then I ask Indian CEOs, tell me today how many projects you have which will be in box two, box three. And box two, box three is about closing possibility gap. Another word for possibility gap is opportunity gap. Another word for opportunity gap is innovation gap. You cannot use the same principles to use to close the performance gap and use the same principles to close possibility gap. Because the way you close performance gap is what I call variance reduction. That's what performance gap is all about. What is total quality management? What is Six Sigma? It's about variance reduction. You give a business plan to your manager and make sure they vary as little as possible from the business plan. 
That's what performance gap management is. Whereas possibility gap management is all about non-linear innovation. It's all about opening up possibilities. It's about variance expansion. You see, if I want to take a look at India's economic history, our, our cultural history is very long, but our economic history is very short. And the phase one of India's economic history, I would say, is from the time we won independence up until the time we liberalized, say, in the early 90s. Phase one, license large, you don't have to be efficient to make money. You can be highly incompetent, highly inefficient, because customers are waiting to buy your product. So you simply pass on your inefficiency to your customers, you still make a lot of money. That's phase one. Phase two is the last two decades where we liberalized it. I would say the phase two, we have essentially, Indian companies have essentially grown by closing performance gap, with a few exceptions. There are always a few exceptions like Narana Hildalaya, or Terracon Revolution, or Mahendra, Mahendra, Scorpio. These are all exceptions. By and large, Indian companies have grown by closing performance gap. Why? Because our performance gap was so huge in 1990. During license Raj, we became highly inefficient, highly incompetent. We had so much fat in the body. We just shed the fat, you grow. I said that game is over. There's only so much you can eke out of closing performance gap. For Indian companies to be great in the next two decades, I think our possibility gap is very huge. Our innovation gap is very huge. For Indian companies to be leaders, by year 2050, our possibility gap is a lot, lot bigger than our performance gap. And if you really believe that, then I challenge Indian companies, what are you doing in 2016 to address your possibility gap? In fact, whenever I'm with Indian CEOs, I always ask them, I know you are executing a lot of projects today. Out of all those projects, can you name three projects you are doing today? which will make you a leader in the year 2050. If the CEOs tell me we are working on portal quality management, <laughs> lean, operational excellence to become leaders in the year 2050, I typically tell them, welcome to 1970. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with these ideas. But they're really box on ideas. They're really table stakes. There is nothing but closing performance gap. By the way, another word for performance management is best practices benchmarking. Best practices benchmarking is not strategy. Think about what happens in best practices benchmarking. Suppose you're doing scissors. What's best practices benchmarking? You cannot look around your industry. You look around others who are doing scissors. And then you ask yourself the question, is there anyone who's doing scissors a little bit better, a little bit smarter? And then you ask yourself the question, what is the gap between myself and the industry leader? Then you put in place programs to close that gap. Imagine, what are you going to look like at the end of that process? How can you aspire for leadership in the year 2015 by doing that in 2016? This is like saying, suppose you're in a locker room and you want to find out how bad your sock smells. Don't go benchmarking your socks against other people's socks in the locker room. <laughs> They're all going to smell about the same. To me, strategy is about creating next practices. It's not about adapting to the best practices of industry leaders today. Strategy is about non-linear innovation. $100 ECG machine is not best practices benchmark. It's next practices. Fosbury flop is not a linear improvement over scissors. It's a non-linear change. If you want another example of best practices versus next practices, a good example of next practice would be the microfinance revolution that Dr. Mohammed Yunus unleashed from Bangladesh in 1983, for which he won a Nobel Prize in 2006. By the way, in 1983, when Dr. Mohammed Yunus innovated microfinance, at that time, he used to be a college professor just like me. He used to teach economics in Bangladesh University. 
And as you well know, Bangladesh is prone to famines. And in 1983, there was a severe famine in Bangladesh. And 166 people from the village where Dr. Mahmoud Yunus grew up, 166 villagers were starving to death. And all that they needed was a $25 home. So Dr. Mahmoud Yunus went to the local commercial bank, which, by the way, happens to be the leading commercial bank in the world. So he went to the local commercial bank and said, I understand you are in the business of lending money. I have even made your life simple. I brought 166 people who desperately need a loan to your doorsteps. Since you are in the business of lending money, why don't you give them the $45 loan? And the commercial bank did their usual risk analysis and concluded these are high risk customers. So they said no. Then Dr. Mahmoud Yunus looked at his pocket, he had $45. He said, why don't I become a banker and give them a $25 loan? Let's see what happens. So he gave them a $25 loan. Something interesting happened. Of course, 166 lives were saved. That was the most important thing that happened, but something else interesting happened. He actually got the money back with 10% interest. So he made a profit. Then he thought to himself, if I make a profit by converting 166 non-consumers a bank into consumers a bank, think about how much money I can make. If I convert every non-consumer a bank into a consumer a bank on planet Earth. And there are five billion unbanked. So he said, let me start a bank to convert five billion non-consumers into consumers and make a ton of money. But he doesn't know how to start a bank. For that matter, he doesn't know how to start any business. He's a college professor like me. As the saying goes, if you can, you do. If you can't, you teach. <laughs> he can't, so he must teach. But he desperately wanted to start this bank. So he went to the local commercial bank and said, I understand you are the leader in the banking industry. Would you be humble enough to give me your secret sauce? I want to set up a bank just like you. I have no idea. <coughs> Can you tell me your best practices? Do you have helpful enough to give me your answer, your, your secret sauce? So Dr. Mahmoud Yunus <coughs> wrote down all the best practices of the leading commercial bank in the world. Then he started his micro-lending institution, the Grameen Bank, with exactly the opposite rules. <laughs> He said, if the best practices of the leader cannot convert non-consumers into consumers, simple common sense tells me next practice has to be the opposite of current best practice. But what the apple did was to take the rules by which telecoms were playing in the late 90s. He said, for me, next practice is to do exactly the opposite. So going back to microfinance, you commercial banks, you take care of 2 million rich, I'll take care of the 5 million poor. You operate in urban areas, I'll operate in rural areas. You lend to men, I'll lend to women. You give thousands and thousands of dollars a loan, the maximum loan you can get from the main bank is $25. You ask for collateral before you give a loan, I'm going to ask for no collateral. You ask people to come to the bank to get the loan, I'm going to take the bank to the people. Since 1983, the main bank has given US $10 billion loans. In $25 increments, that's a lot of loans. With 99% better than In fact, the main bank has been one of the most profitable commercial banks. It's not a charity, it's not a non-profit, it's as much a profit maximizer as General Electric is. In fact, the only year they didn't make money was 1983. You've got to give them a break for the startup year. <laughs> Their business model is based on common sense, as you know. Depositors become borrowers. And depositors are put in a self-help group of nine. And the self-help group of nine will decide who amongst them will get the $25 loan. That means there is no need to submit a loan application. If there is no loan application, there is no job for risk officers in the bank. Green Bank has no intention of taking anyone to a court of law if they don't repay. 
You're not going to take anyone to a court of law if they don't need pay. You don't need contracts. If there are no contracts, there is no job for lawyers in Brahmin Bank either. And how do they get the 99% better? Peer pressure. If anyone in that self-help group does not need pay, that self-help group cannot get another loan. I was recently talking to the management team in Grameen Bank and I asked them, have you done any other next practice since 1980? And the management team told me, BG, we only do next practice. We never benchmark ourselves against other commercial banks. Let me give you an example of a next practice we are trying. Six months ago, the management team in Grameen Bank decided they will convert another non-consumer bank into a consumer bank. So they targeted beggars. See, beggars are the bottom, at the bottom, at the bottom of the economic pyramid. They said, why should they not have access to banks? So six months ago, the management team in Grameen Bank started a box three experiment by catching all the 10 beggars on the streets of Bangladesh and said, now your customers are Grameen Bank. They're going to get a $25 loan. As you know, micro lending is always connected to micro enterprise. So they give you some training so that you use, you build some skills and use the $25 to start a micro enterprise so that you can become sustainable. This is the micro enterprise they help them to start. You are a beggar. You go begging door to door every day. When you go begging door to door every day, ask the household whether they need anything. Maybe they need vegetables. Maybe they need thorns. Maybe they need cookies. <coughs> Use your $25 to buy whatever they need. Of course, you can charge the profit market. After all, you are providing a valuable service. You keep all the profits. Give me back my $25 with 10% interest. Then I will give you a $30 loan. This is the way they wanted to make sure these beggars stay in the system. And the management team in Grameen Bank was telling me, we started this box three experiment with 10 beggars six months ago. We thought we may enroll 100 beggars. They have enrolled 500,000 beggars. <laughs> it is one of the most profitable customer segments for Grameen Bank today. I bet you Bank of America or Citibank will not have that cost. <laughs> Out of the 500,000 beggars, half of them have become door-to-door -door salesmen. Yes, sir, this is a darn good business model. I wish I more about it sooner. But the remaining 250,000 beggars, 50,000 of them had decided to stick to their core. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, common, namely, this is too common. The remaining 200,000 beggars figured out they can do both. <laughs> there were some houses which were good for betting. There were other houses ideal for selling even without attending a great business school like Byron. <laughs> they figured out how to do market segmentation. <laughs> I say, if you want to close possibility gap, we must create next practices. We must have non-linear thinking. We must have leapfrog thinking. We must think differently. By the way, I got this notion of thinking differently by watching Tamil movies. I grew up with Tamil Nadu, the Kamalas and Rajinikant movies. <laughs> I remember one movie of Rajinikant, there in the last 30 minutes of the movie, the villain ties down Rajinikant and kidnaps the hero in a Mercedes, of course. <laughs> and the police jump into the police van and start chasing the Mercedes. See, police van plays by the same rules by which the Mercedes they can only go on the same roads where automobiles can go. And one only thing is the police van is a little slower than the Mercedes. So you can see in the movie the gap between the Mercedes and the police van keeps on increasing. <laughs> After about 10 minutes, Rajinikan unties himself and he knows one thing, he's already 10 minutes too late. You cannot catch up with that Mercedes by closing performance gap. We cannot do best practices benchmark. We have to create next practice. We have to have need for thinking. We have to have breakthrough thinking. So what does Rajinikanth do? 
See, he jumps on top of a horse. See, a horse can maneuver in narrow lanes that cars can't go. So he goes to all the back alleys, climbs a mountain, and jumps in front of the Mercedes. That is thinking differently. <laughs> <laughs> I say, this India has to become a great country in the next year. We are recreating. That's the job of Burma. That's box training. And everything that gets recreated will be preserved. In fact, I simply took this preservation, destruction, recreation as a continuous rhythmic process for human existence. I simply took what was written down 3,500 years ago and simply repackaged it and presented it to companies. I'd say if your company has to remain an institution forever, you also need to master this preservation, destruction, recreation as a rhythmic, ongoing leadership imperative. By the way, Hindu scriptures also married the right to poverty. Poverty is a goddess of power. You need power to destroy things. Brahma is married to Saraswati. Saraswati is a goddess of wisdom and insight. That's what you need in order to develop insights about the future. I've simply taken what we know and apply it to companies. An important leadership imperative for India is to ask the question, how do I go about closing my possibility gap when I'm managing the performance gap? By the way, this dream box thinking is not just for corporations. You can also use it to run your own personal life. I use it in my personal life. Every one of you in this room, you've got to have a dream. You've got to ask yourself, what are the big signals you're seeing? What are the new competencies you need to embed in yourself? When I was growing up in a small town in India, my ambition was to go to Harvard Business School, to do an MBA. Impossible. But got me making it excited every day. What are the competencies I need to have? What are the capabilities I need to build? Everyone in this room, you are going to take a look at your calendar every day and ask yourself the question, then enough time today have in Boston? Have I spent enough time today in Boston? Have I spent enough time today in Boston? For you also, future is now. Future is not about what you have to do in the future. Yet, as human beings, we always focus on today every day. Because year 2023 looks too abstract. But on January 30th, 2016 is real. Think of it this way. Suppose you focused on today every day because that's the only thing that looks real. Tomorrow you focus on January 30th, 1st, 2016. If you did that every day, then one day you're going to wake up and year 2025 will be today. That's a lousy way to run a country. That's a lousy way to run a company. That's a lousy way to run one's personal life. I really believe, this is also about India, I really believe the 21st century is going to be the innovation century. And India has the rare opportunity to really become the world leader in innovation. And the kind of innovations that we have to lead in India is what I call constraint-based innovation. Because if you want to convert 1 million non-consumers into consumers, you have to think about constraint-based innovation. In fact, the IT services industry so far has only done something cheaper for the best. Time has come for the IT services industry to look at India. For that matter, every Indian company to look at India. And let's innovate for India. And when you want to innovate for India, you've got to convert those 1 billion non-consumers into consumers, whether it is in health, education, transportation, energy, in every sector, India is waiting to consume. And if India is waiting to consume, those non-consumers will become consumers only if you come up with next practices, only if you come up with breakthrough thinking. They mentally change our definition of innovation. In the best, if you ask an American company, what do you need? for doing innovation, they will ask, we need more money. That's how we think in the West. Whereas in India, we have to think about spending less. I mean, I care, it's not by spending more, it's by spending less. Whereas in the US, we always think about, when we want to do innovation, we want to spend more money. Take, for instance, a company like Gillette. 100 years ago, Mr. Gillette came up with a breakthrough innovation called Razor 
and a play. That was his breakthrough innovation. The reason it was a breakthrough innovation 100 years ago was he sold the racer to you, and once you bought Gillette Racer, then it built a platform on which they, you have to continuously buy their plates. So it created a need for high margin, annuity of high margin plates. They call it the Racer and Blades business model. That was his breakthrough innovation 100 years ago. Then the Gillette as an organization wanted to do more innovation. So what did they do? They spent even more money and came up with Track 2. And Track 2 is a two-blade system. And the reason they came up with the two-blade system was with the two-blade system, you can share twice as fast. Because on a single pass, more hair comes off as compared to a single blade system. So that was again a huge success. Then Gillette wanted to do more innovation. What did they do? They spent even more money. And believe it or not, they come up with Mac 3, which is a three-blade system. Nobody can convince me a three-blade system shaves three times as fast as a single blade system. But Americans are willing to buy whatever you throw it. They got money. Even if they don't need it, they'll buy it. Then Gillette wants to do more innovation. What do they do? They spend even more money. And believe it or not, they have got fusion, which is a five-blade system. <laughs> Nobody can tell me five blades shave five times faster than a single blade. So you'll have a 25 blade system. <laughs> in the US, we think innovation means we've got to spend more money. I say we must change the definition of innovation. Costly innovation in India, we should spend less. In fact, change the definition of innovation from value for money to value for many. Value for many, to me, is to do more with less. To do a lot more with a lot less for a lot of people. Narana Dalia is about value for many. I mean, I care is about value for many. What Bharti Antle has done is value for many. You want another example? Last year, India launched a satellite to Mars. By the way, there are only three other countries which have launched satellite to Mars. These are very rich countries. US, Europe, and Russia. The fourth country to do it is a poor country called India. But the real deal is, we only spent $75 million on that innovation. Just about the same time, U.S. also launched a satellite to Mars. That costed $2 billion. By the way, both are doing the same job. As we speak, both the satellites are circling around Mars. They did the same job. We spent $75 million, they spent $2,000 million. That's what Google innovation is all about. That's what constraint-based innovation is all about. By the way, a couple of years ago, there was a movie that was made called Gravity. See, Gravity is a movie about failed mission to Mars. And that movie costed $150 million. So a Hollywood make-believe failed mission to Mars cost twice as much as India's successful mission to Mars. <laughs> this is India's century. The way I look at it is, I am so excited when I meet the youngsters in India. They have high energy, high aspiration. They have really, really got competence. So we got India has tremendous human potential. Then I look at the next 100 years. Our possibility gap is so huge. We got a great human potential. We have a huge possibility gap. What are we waiting for? It's a very <coughs> message. Thank you very much. about mindset, you know, and basic requirement. All these days, there is a question of obedience to parents and the teacher. You will never allow you to think. You have just said, follow what you are doing. Nowadays, the mindset is changing. And I think you put it very well. I think it's a mindset issue. I think thinking differently is about a mindset issue. Maybe in the previous generation, we were made the teacher, we obey teachers. the elders, etc. The younger generation is hungry. They are asked high aspirational. They can do the Rajinikan kind of moves. So <laughs> I think that's the whole point. And I think my point is this No more drinkers. 
another example to add is the uh, Hambo industry uh, in India, particularly from Kerala. And so selling in the bottles, they started selling in the sachets. Another example. Sachets is a good example, but sachets is essentially dividing the larger product into many smaller products. And the real innovation in, in, in sachets is not so much the product, because if you think of a, a bottle, which is a one gallon bottle, suppose you sell the same one gallon bottle in 10,000 sachets, certainly you bring down the price point. But selling 10,000 sachets, will, the distribution cost will be a lot more than selling one bottle of one gallon. Therefore, the real innovation for Hindustan labor and others is distribution contribution. Thereby, the distribution costs are identical whether you are selling 10,000 sachets or one bottle. Unless you can do that, you are not going to have a long term. One last question. Uh, no, sir, uh, you told about the lemongrassic dividend of India and how it can make a huge impact. So, India is also a place where 12 million Indians come out in a year with uh, medium Indians that are unqualified for any job. We are churning out hundreds of thousands of master's degree holders with no mastery over anything. The Coursera's, uh, MIT EDUs haven't been able to make an impact so far. Right? So what is the non-linear breakthrough that can happen here? That requires me and several hours talking about what can we do in the field of education in Bob Street. And I, 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 many, very quickly I point this out. See, in the US, our education system is completely broke, not just in India. Even in the US, it's broke. Because the cost of education in the US is growing much faster than cost of healthcare. Uh, the place where I teach, Dartmouth College, the tuition is $75,000 a year. That means for a four-year degree, it's three hundred thousand dollars. And if the four-year degree is three hundred thousand dollars, the only very rich can afford it. They can write the check. Or the very poor can afford it because they get outright scholarship. But the middle class gets squeezed in because because the middle class makes enough money they are not entitled to scholarship, and you start taking them and they don't have enough money to pay for three hundred thousand dollars. If you take a loan for three hundred thousand dollars, you are paying that back forever. Now I ask the question, why is the cost of education so high in the US? And it's three reasons. Number one is we bundle the product in the US. By bundle the product, what I mean is we bundle teaching and research and selling to the schools. Whereas teaching is the only thing that generates revenues. Research doesn't generate revenues. But we bundle teaching and research and ask the student to pay for a part that doesn't generate revenues. As an example, I only teach one course at Dartmouth, and that course meets for four and a half weeks, two times a week. So that means only nine days out of 365 days, I am actually in front of the schools. They should be only paying for those nine days. That's the only nine days they see me. But they pay for my 365 days salary. So we bundle the product and ask the student to pay for things which generate, doesn't generate revenue. Second is, we do everything in residential. The moment you do everything in residential, cost goes through the roof. Because you need to build a dock, you need to have cafeteria, you need to have classrooms, you need to have football stadiums, you need to have this, you need to have that, that adds to the cost. The third is, in the US, we do not believe in the principle of inclusion. We believe in the principle of exclusion. In fact, we take a lot of pride in saying how our admission rejects so many people. In fact, we are even ranked by magazines based on how low our admission rate is. Can you think of another industry which, so if 100 people apply, you only really take 5% of it. We reject 95%. And we are not even nice. We say get lost. 